meeting or the webinar. And I'm also going to get us going on YouTube as well. So we'll get, I'm sure it will go viral on YouTube. It will be a big hit. <laughs> Everyone's going to want to watch us. There we go. Um, all right, so uh, we'll go over um, a few housekeeping items to start. And um, sorry for the crazy mouse going across your screen. There we go. Um, so um, again, welcome. I'm Jamie Fitch, the Sustainability Coordinator. Um, thank you all for volunteering um, as a volunteer beach monitor for the season. Um, we have about 70 people who have um, volunteered with the town this year. So um, I think that's the most that um, we've had since um, I started working for the town um, four years ago. Um, so thank you all for your, um, in advance for your time and dedication. Um, I'm going to try to look at you all too. Okay. <laughs> I know those of you who are here, I'm like, I need to look at my notes. I need to see who's on here. Um, so I, I just want to start with a, a couple of um, housekeeping items um, before we get underway. So as I mentioned, this um, training is being recorded um, and will be available on YouTube um, Pretty much immediate people can watch it now on youtube if they really want to um but the link will be sent out to those who weren't able to join us tonight um zoom attendees as a reminder we can't hear or see you i will be looking for um for your raised hands um to get the raise hand button you just need to either hover your mouse over the screen and it should appear um or if you're on a tablet or a phone you can tap the screen and hopefully you'll be able to see um, where that raise hand function is you can also put things in the chat if you want to. I will be um, monitoring that as well. Um, and I will do my best to, um, to pay attention to you all and everyone here as well. It will be an amazing feat. Um, all right, and so if you raise your hand, we'll unmute you and allow you to talk um, and ask your questions. Um, everyone who has signed up to volunteer should have received, um, you can come in and have a seat too if you'd like. Um, Everyone should have um, received my weekly update emails. Um, and so there was a very long email last week with some information about the season. Um, and so I mentioned it in the, in the email, but I'll mention it tonight also. Thank you all for reading that. Um, that was full of information. Um, I'm sure there are questions. Hopefully we'll answer some of them tonight um, without you having to ask them. And if there are still unanswered questions, feel free to, um, to ask them this evening as well. Um, Past volunteers will remember that there's often a whole info packet or a whole packet of forms that we ask you to, um, to fill out for um, the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Um, they, um, the time that um, you all as volunteers and the volunteers throughout the state spend on this program generates um, a whole lot of match for IFNW and they um, get federal funding because of the time that is spent on these beaches. Um, and this year they've gone to um, an online process for their forms. So we have um, Brad Zitsky from IFNW here with us this evening, who will walk us through um, the online forms um, and all of that. And we will be asking you to record your, um, the time that you spend on our beaches um, more fr frequently than you may have in the past. So we'll be asking you to try to go in um, at least every month, um, ideally every week to kind of record the time that you spend um, on the beach. and. Um, Brad will walk us through that later on this evening. Excuse me. Dan. Yes. Do we do this on paper? So it's all going to be online. Okay. And if it if you have trouble with that, um, we will work out a way that you can just um, shoot me an email or something, and I can enter it in for you. Um, but ideally, um, folks will be doing this on their own. We'll we'll help you. Um, I'm not very good on computer. Okay. Uh, I'll work you through that in a bit, Dave. Towards towards the end here, I'll walk you through it step by step, but uh, tell you what's worked and what hasn't. It's Thank over you. to town. You're very you. welcome. Just hang on. So, and this is definitely, um, uh, I, we're all going to learn through this process together. So, um, and Brad is always looking for feedback for ways to stream like streamline it and make it um, more user friendly and easier. Um, so, we'll go through that this evening. Um, also in the past, uh, I've provided um, volunteers with observation forms where you can record um, kind of when you were on the beach, things that you saw, record the number of um, adults and chicks that you saw, the number of dogs, 
that you uh, may have observed on the beach, any interactions that you had, um, those paper forms are still available. Um, we also have an online form option if you um, are interested in just um, pulling up the form either on your computer, on your smartphone or whatever, and filling it out that way. Um, so I will um, send information with next week's update about that, including the form that can be printed if you prefer to work on paper um, or the online form. Um, a note for, um, for folks from um, who are volunteering at Ferry and Western Beach and Pine Point, um, I will send out preliminary schedules later on this week to you all um, based on the availability that you indicated when you signed up to volunteer. Um, I'll ask you to get back to me with like a thumbs up or a thumbs down if that schedule is going to work for you. Um, and then we'll finalize the, um, the schedules probably by the end of next week because our monitoring really gets going um, for May 15th when our dog regulations change. And I'll walk you through those in just a minute. And a note for any Higgins folks who may be joining us tonight, Glennis will be communicating with you um, with your schedule um, directly. And for those of you from Higgins and, and Pine Point that might not, or uh, Ferry Beach and Pine Point, that might not make much sense, but um, Glennis is um, a longtime volunteer and she kind of um, runs the volunteer program down at Higgins Beach um, for us um, because there are a whole lot of volunteers on Higgins Beach. Um, what am I forgetting? Oh, um, those who got here a little bit early, you all should have received um, an envelope and those who came in late, I'll um, see me afterwards and I'll get them these to you. Um, so these are um, your volunteer beach monitor ID. So we ask that you wear this during your monitoring shifts so that beach goers can identify you um, as a volunteer. And also there is a parking pass in there um, that will allow you to access the um, public lot on Pine Point um, and Ferry Beach during um, your monitoring shift. Um, and for Higgins folks, this, um, there's a designated parking spot close to the beach, where if you display this on your, um, I don't even know if you can see me, but I'll show it to you. Um, <laughs> display this on your windshield um, and uh, during your monitoring shift. And Higgins folks, um, these will be provided to Glennis, who will get them to you um, soon. I'm actually going to be down there tomorrow night so um, to give Glennis these, and um, there's another meeting tomorrow night with those folks. And anyone who is joining us virtually this evening, um, you um, after tonight can pick up your ID badge and um, parking pass in the planning office um, at Town Hall, which is in the basement. Um, all of that information was in the super long email that I sent out last week and I'll send a reminder with next week's update also. Oh, and just one note. Um, as we walk through, I'm going to stop screen sharing so you guys at home can see, maybe, so that you can see what I'm talking about here. I can figure out how to get my mouse going in the right direction. All right. So um, on the, I, the back of the ID badge um, are important phone numbers um, in case you're, when you're out monitoring, if you need to get a hold of anyone. This will all make a little bit more sense as we walk through um, the presentation. Um, but on there is um, my office phone number, the phone number for Scarborough Dispatch, um, Maine Audubon has a Plover hotline, um, and the, also the Maine Warden Service number is on there, and we'll talk about when you might need to um, use those various numbers when you're out um, during your shift. And um, for Higgins folks, Glennis's number is on the back of your ID badge as well. Um, and then just one more note, I think something that I wanted to call to your attention in the email that went out last week, um, it had some additional information as attachments. Um, Audubon put together an information sheet about plovers. Um, we're going to talk a lot about, well, the presentation tonight will go over some of that stuff, um, but it's just kind of some supplemental information for you. Um, the town has put together a brochure about um, sharing the beach with shorebirds that has some information about plovers and then our ordinances and restricted areas on our beaches. Um, and it, I provided you with a summary of our um, ordinances, our piping plover protection ordinance and our animal control ordinance, which are um, relevant to um, all of this stuff. So that is um, another big intro overview. Um, and we will get going. I'm going to attempt to share my screen again. 
we'll see how this goes. There we go. Um, and I just want to touch base before we get into um, Audubon's presentation with a little bit of housekeeping or a little bit of information for um, with on um, some stuff about Scarborough. So I mentioned restricted areas and I just wanna walk you through um, where the restricted areas are on all of our beaches. Um, and so we'll start with, with Higgins. So our restricted area goes into effect um, April 1st um, and restricted area is um, restricted for dogs. So on Higgins Beach between April 1st and Labor Day, um, dogs are not allowed or should not be um, in the area from Champion Street um, down to the Scarborough River, um, excuse me, Spurlink River. Um, this is uh, the typical nesting area for, um, for plovers on Higgins Beach. Um, and I will we'll get to in a minute um, what happens after, after May 15th um, on our beaches. So um, looking at ferry and Western beaches. So just to orient you, this is the um, municipal parking lot on Ferry Beach. Um, the restricted area on, on these two beaches runs from the edge of the municipal lot um, around the corner and down to uh, Prout's Neck. So this area is actually Western Beach. And that is the area um, where plovers typically nest um, on this beach. Um, so while I, while a lot of the information says ferry in Western beaches, most of um, your time as volunteers will be spent on Western beach because that's where the plovers are going to be typically. Um, and then on Pine Point, our restricted area runs from the edge of the herd park parking lot down to the jetty. And um, on Pine Point, this one is a little bit different because dogs are allowed in the restricted area, but they need to be leashed. Um, so in our other two beaches, um, dogs should not be in that area at all. Um, and on Pine Point, they're supposed Excuse to be me, leashed. Jamie? Yes. In that restricted area, dogs can be allowed, but they have to be on the leash. They have to be on the leash, correct. Thank you. Yes. And then I just want to give a quick overview of our the town summer um, dog rules. So this information um, was in the um, the sharing the beach with shorebirds brochure um, that was attached to the email that I sent out last week. Um, but at starting um, eight fifteen or excuse me, starting on May fifteenth, um, these uh, rules go into effect. So um, dogs um, are allowed on our beaches from sunrise to 9 a.m. They can be off leash outside of the restricted area as long as they're under voice and sight control. Um, between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m., um, dogs should not be on the beach at all. From 5 p.m. to um, sunset, they are allowed on, on the beach as long as they are leashed. And then in the overnight hours, dogs and people, honestly, should not be on our beaches. So that is um, a quick overview of our, um, our summer dog rules. Um, we are gonna talk um, quite a bit about um, why these rules are in place. Um, and uh, um, we'll talk about ways to interact with the public um, when there are dogs on the beach. Um, I know last summer I was spending some, uh, quite a bit of time um, in, at Heard Park um, just after our changeover, and I can't tell you how many people I had to stop in our parking lot at Heard Park and say, I'm sorry, you can't take your dog on the beach. Um, we have rules that go into effect um, as of May 15th. There are signs posted on the beach with that information. Um, signs are really easy to ignore, um, unfortunately. Um, and so that's part of the reason it's so important to have all of you as volunteers, as our eyes and ears on the beach and educating um, beach goers about the, uh, the rules and, and the plovers themselves um, and, and how to protect them. So um, with that, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to make sure, see, does anyone in Zoom world have any questions or does anyone here have any questions before? Yeah, go ahead. Are dogs allowed in the non-restricted area on the beach or is it as of May 15th, between the hours of 9 a.m. and 5 p.m., dogs are not supposed to be on the beach. Okay. So regardless of where the lines are drawn. Right. Yeah. And I will note um, 
on all of our beaches, there are signs at the beginning of the restricted area. So literally for people to walk their dog in that area, they have to walk by a sign that says, please keep your dog out of this area. As I recall, um, Ferry and Western had a sign, no dogs, period, on Western Beach. Yeah, there is a sign. Um, so I, I believe that um, the our sign, our restricted area signs don't necessarily come down at the end of the season. They, they're they kind of up all year round. It's a matter of if Public Works can get there to, to take them down or not. We do have different signs um, at the entrance of the beaches that, um, that, talk, that we do switch um, with the season to say when dogs are and are not allowed on the beach. Um, but yeah, there, there is a sign um, that, that says, it's actually, um, I think there are two signs. One is um, next to, on the beach, next to like the corner of the, the parking lot mm -hmm. that says mm -hmm. no dogs beyond this point. And there's another right. one a bit further down on Western um, that again says no right. dogs beyond this point. So that, that just says no dogs, period, on yeah. that sign. Yeah. And nothing about the nine. The... Yes, because in that area, there should not be any dogs. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me, that property is owned by the Crowd Snack Country Club. Mm -hmm. So they have uh, an agreement with our, my department, much does, much like the town of Scarborough. Um, and that's their rule. Okay. Rules so so that's, that's different from the other beaches. Huh? Um, well, on Higgins as well, um, there's um, it's really enforced starting um, April 1st through right. Labor Day, mm -hmm. um, but the sign may be there all the time. I'm not entirely I think they're sure. Out there. I think there's three large signs because um, we saw a dog walking today and he kind of came up to the signs and, and went the other way. So at least somebody was paying attention yeah. to the sign. The tricky thing is that low tide when folks are way down by the water line. They don't always see the sign. I'm, yeah. This is always a tough time of year um, when people have that adjustment period in the whole month of April. I was out at Western a couple of times in the last couple of weeks, and there's still people out there, including folks. I've been coming here for 35 years, and no one's, you know, you, you hear all of that, I'm sure. But um, yeah. Yeah, so and I, I had had someone last year tell me that um, they called the town office and were told that dogs could go on the beach. And then they realized they had called the Old Orchard Beach Town Office <laughs> and they were at Pine Point in Scarborough. So two totally different towns, two different um, different sets of rules. So um, we got to the bottom of that one, but yeah, that was that one was fun too. All right, I will stop talking now and hand it over. Christian Parent, I am one of the Audubon employees working on the Clover Crew. Um, so I'm going to be your point of contact for Pine Point Western Ferry. Um, and then Higgins is the only other beach you guys. Mm -hmm. That will be Emma Sloan. Some of you may have heard her name. Um, she'll be your point of contact there. So thanks everybody for coming. I know that it is evening after a Tuesday. So we'll try to make it pretty quick here. Um, I'm just going to say next slide. Yeah. I think that'll, that'll go the smoothest, right? And I just, um, just to mention, um, oh, Laura and Laura, very important. <laughs> Laura and Laura are the stars of the show. Um, Laura Zitsky, her husband is back here. Um, she has been doing this project for a very long time. She puts blood, sweat, and tears into this um, to make sure that these birds are protected. Um, and she hired Laura Williams on this year will be her first year as a full-time biologist, um, also doing lots of work. So these two women are rock stars in this and we totally could not have this program without without the two of them. So when you see them, say thanks. <laughs> What's your first name again? Rachel. Rachel. Yep. And then parents, just like a mom and yeah. dad. And um, I also want to mention that, um, so the town, Higgins, Ferry and Western and Pine Point, Scarborough Beach State Park also has plovers on their beaches, um, but the state park staff take care of the monitoring that happens on that beach. Um, the information that I send out on a weekly basis still has Scarborough Beach State Park on there. Um, included in the plumber numbers, because people are always interested um, in how we as a, a town are doing with our, our plumbers. All right, so I am sure that you have all seen this bird before. This is our piping plumber. So we love this bird. This is why we're all here. Um, and smaller, 
Um, they're sandy colored, so they blend in really well. Um, they feed on marine worms, crustaceans, and vertebrates down in the intertidal zones. Um, and then you can see the size difference here. Um, and that kind of just shows against some of the other birds how little, but you guys already know that you've seen them before. Next slide, please. And then um, we'll have the least turns. They'll be showing up here pretty soon. Um, also very important to so they're about eight to 10 inches. Um, and in comparison to the common turn, which is about 13 to 16, so they're going to be a little bit smaller. Um, they feed on forge fish and invertebrates. Um, these guys are a little trickier with their nesting, uh, where the plovers will kind of go and hide their eggs in dune grass or up uh, near the dunes. These guys will just drop it, plop it right in the middle of the beach, wherever. Um, so you have to be really careful of their eggs once nesting starts for them. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so our plovers are adapted to nesting on the beach. Um, there are thousands of years of evolution behind these guys, and they are pros at this. Um, so if they have a nest, I know you guys remember that big storm we had a few weeks ago. Um, I think we probably lost a few eggs. They were probably washed in that. Um, but the good news is that these birds, they can re-nest. So if they lose one or two eggs at the beginning, they're totally fine with having a clutch of two, or sometimes they can even go further. And um, they have also been seen, they can, they can get an egg if it's not too far out of the nest and it has washed, they can kind of push their egg back up. Um, so they really do care about these eggs once they come out. Um, okay, so this is the goal. We want these baby birds all over the beach. Um, they're obviously even smaller than their moms and dads. Um, they're only about two to three inches, so really, really tiny out there. They blend in perfectly with the sand. Um, they're they're very, very, very vulnerable at this time. Um, so when they're born, they're going down to the water with their siblings to feed hours after they hatch. Um, so obviously they're vulnerable to predation at this time, but more so than that, they're gonna be vulnerable to the hundreds of people that we see on the beaches. Um, so here you're gonna see the beach environment um, and the <coughs> habitats. So they're gonna nest um, up in the dune areas and you guys have seen that. Sometimes they'll come a little further down, um, but we prefer if they keep it up, up by the grass. And then they'll feed anywhere from that dune line all the way down into the intertidal zones, um, all the way down to low tide. Okay, so we're gonna focus a little on both chicks here, the least turns. Um, so they're endangered in Maine. Let me back up here. Endangered, um, so what endangered species are, that means that they are at the brink of extinction right now, if we don't do something. Um, and threatened species, that means they're likely to be in that endangered zone quickly if we, again, don't do something. Uh, so here in Maine, our threatened species are afforded the same protections as endangered. Um, so these terns are endangered in Maine, but they're not listed uh, federally at all. Um, but the plovers are endangered in Maine, and then they're threatened federally. So um, on a big scale, we're, we're making sure that these plover chicks are being taken care of. Okay, so when our birds show up, this is what the beaches are looking like. Um, I'm sure you've all taken a walk on any beach in April, and you know there's only a few people out there. Um, so when they show up, this is prime nesting habitat. Um, but then, of course, things get a little bit crazier as we go along. Um, next slide, please. So obviously a beach is a tough place for an animal to live. Um, there's crazy storms, um, there's temperature extremes, there are predators. Um, so it's really dynamic out there and there are a lot of dangers that these birds can run into um, just in their daily day to day. Um, and one of those is the hundreds of guests that we see on our main beaches come June, July, August. Um, so when they show up, they think it's great. And by the time their chicks hatch, they're dodging everybody to get down to the shoreline to feed, which is okay as long as the public is aware um, that these birds are trying to get through. Um, okay, so a lot of our birds will show up um, this year, especially they came early and got settled. Um, but basically what they do is they stake out their territory, they find a mate, this is their ever so lovely mating dance, it doesn't look very romantic, but it is. Um, so they find their mate, mate, and then they nest. Um, 
So usually through April and May is when we're going to find them um, creating nesting spaces. So here are some examples of nests. Um, and today, actually, I was at Higgins. We have three nests. Two of them are four full clutches, um, and they're incubating. And then the third nest has two. Um, but mom or dad was very committed to those eggs and yelling at us today when we were putting out an exclosure. So they're very active and very involved in their eggs right now on Higgins. Um, How many do you anticipate like, on Higgins? On Higgins, I think we're thinking we have three pairs right now. I mean, overall, what were you thinking the total number would be? Maybe not more than that. We're hoping each of them have their, their four babies. Um, but they seem to be pretty committed to territories at this point, and we haven't seen more than the three pairs there. Okay, um, so it's the same for the other ones, the counts that we're seeing now for the first count. Yeah, and it, you know, sometimes we go out there and we see no signs of birds at all. Um, but we try not to change the counts too much because we assume that they're still, still around. Um, the nesting area and the, the habitat on Higgins is down towards the end on the spur wing side. Um, so there's not a ton of room down there. Um, so the three birds, they're, they're pretty spread out right now, um, but we haven't seen signs of anything else there. And there still might be birds that show up, certainly. Um, but what we're thinking right now is we'll have those, just those three pairs. Um, and like I said, two of them have their four egg clutches and then the third pair has two already. And just a note that um, you mentioned, so the plovers, they will typically lay four eggs. They don't usually start to incubate those eggs until at least three and often four have been laid. Um, and it's once, maybe you're going to get to this and I might be jumping the gun on the <laughs> Um So, and then once um, the birds do appear to be committed to their, their eggs is when um, Audubon staff will put exclosures or those big cages mm -hmm. um, around their nests on the beach to help keep predators out mm -hmm. um, to protect the nests. And we usually try to do that um, between three and four eggs in the clutch just because we don't want them to get nervous and abandon their eggs. Um, if they have more eggs in the clutch, they tend to be more invested in that area. So the clutch is just the, the eggs themselves. Yes. Yep. The clutch. And when yep. they're incubating, mm -hmm. incubating, are they sitting on them? Mm -hmm. or yep. And mom and dad share that responsibility equally. So somebody mm -hmm. will sit and someone will forge and then they'll switch yeah. off nicely. Mm -hmm. is, is three a typical number? Four is the typical number. Um, you, you might see a clutch of three if they lost an egg early on. They may just do three. Um, if there was predation and, and one egg was taken, they'll certainly take care of those three eggs, uh, but they won't go past four eggs. Um, actually, I was talking about the nest. You said there were three. Oh, on Higgins. Oh, on Higgins, yes, yeah, yep. Is that a typical number? Um, it depends. I think it's pretty typical for um, Higgins. I know Agunquit already has five nests, and I think we have about 15 pairs out there. So it really depends on the beach and the habitat. Um, but I think as far as that area that's available on Higgins, three is a pretty good number. They're nicely spaced so they don't have to fight each other for, for resources. We had five nests, five pairs and five nests at Higgins last. Yeah, I was gonna okay. say three might be a little bit low for Higgins. Um, and then Western tends to be our most productive beach, um, usually like six or seven. Is I think right? we have six oh, eight eight right now. Um, six nine. on Western, but nobody's done an egg yet, I believe. It's, and then nothing over on the ferry side. And I don't think we have any nests yet on Pine Point either. So there, um, I heard that they thought that there might be evidence of a nest coming like on the actually on the old orchard beach side of pine point um but nothing is confirmed yet there so fingers crossed this week we'll have an egg down there we'll have a question. yeah what is it's unclear what i think it is that they're separate and they're not but they have a baby with they're mm -hmm. just unpaired yeah, yeah so the first year um they typically don't they don't pair up okay. um so you may have birds you'll see single males a lot and yeah. sometimes you'll even see them scraping but they don't have a partner Okay. Um, it's just kind of their instinct to do. So okay. yeah, unpaired. Um, and it's sometimes it's tough to say that they're actually unpaired because their partner could be off forging or doing something else. Uh -huh. But typically, if we see two birds hanging out together and they're not fighting with each other, 
we assume that those two are a pair. Mm -hmm. So obviously, oh, hold on, there's one oh, more question. Sorry. So they scrape um, in the sand to form a nest. So these are actually nests that you're seeing on the screen right now. So it's not a nest like you would typically think of, like they're gathering sticks and leaves and things like that. They are literally just digging out or scraping out um, a hollow in the sand. And the male does that. The male does a lot of these scrapes, oh. these shallow depressions in the sand. I was, I was uh, leading a group out on uh, Western a couple of weeks ago. And we saw a male do four scrapes within about 50 feet of each other. And the female was kind of following them around. She's checked so one out. <laughs> and the and checked the other one out. And yeah. It's like shopping in a, in a real estate market. You know, you have to try everything out before you pick it. It's got to have a nice kitchen. Yeah. Um, obviously, eggs are very difficult to see in the sand. Um, so this can create issues with people not seeing them if they're not inside of management, people can step on them easily. Um, so that's one of the major reasons we try to pull that management down. If we're seeing active scraping areas where we think they may choose to nest, we try to get those in management too, just to eliminate the risk of any damage to the eggs. And by management, um, she means the stake and the twine that is um, kind of cordoning off certain areas of the beach. Those are areas where um, plovers will typically nest. So because it is so difficult to see the eggs, they want to keep people out of that area um, because they're super easy to step on. So what you see, but so how often uh, are you at, at the beach uh, in terms of timing? I mean, I, my sense is you guys already got all this under control. You know where this is happening. And, and I wish we had. We're just watching them protect from the dogs from getting in there and stuff like that. Is that the case, or do you think there are actually situations where you may not have yet gotten to the beach? Absolutely, so that's the case. How yeah. often do you go like the Western? So I'm a state shore bird biologist um, for inland fisheries and wildlife, and unfortunately, I'm mostly behind the desk these days. Um, but the Audubon crews, who we essentially contract. Uh, the state contracts out on to see uh, Rachel and her mixed, confusing guard on the <laughs> this side. And we're really and so I can walk in the dunes without people yelling at me. <laughs> so they usually have about five to eight people on their crew, two to three different crews going out. They try to hit, hit each beach of 22 to 25 in the whole state. Park in the north, they try to hit each beach a couple of times a week. Um, and there's definitely circumstances where volunteers are, hey, I've seen a lot of action over here. You guys should get some management up. But those are absolutely, that's good, great information to have um, because these guys don't move around too. Um, they're not quite sure if they like this area. They're going to be down here. Uh, we saw that at Reed last week when we were doing some field work up there. Um, and that's where you put that stake and twine of the symbolic fencing up as much as you can. It's easier done or said than done in some places, but. Uh, and you guys really do play a super important huge. role. So there's a lot of times where we get a volunteer, they get in touch with their coordinator and they're like, listen, we saw you know a lot of really fresh scrapes in this area and they're not in management. The birds were there, they were active. And then, you know, JV can send us an email and the next day we can get out there and we can stake and twine it and get them in. Um, I believe Wells Beach, one of the volunteers found um, the first clutch of the season. So you guys really are, you're out there, you see those birds a lot more. And we try to be out there as much as we can, obviously, but we're stretched quite a bit with a small crew. So you, you guys really are important to that. And then especially once the eggs hatch and we've got chicks running around the beach, then it becomes even more important to have the guys out there. <laughs> so if I'm understanding this correctly, as volunteers, we would report to you people. So Jamie, you'd probably connect then, with me. Yeah. And then I would relay the information okay. to Audubon. Because a lot of the time we're out there on the beach, um, we don't have good cell phone reception or whatever it may be. So she knows how to, to get in touch with us immediately. That way we can get out there and focus on. And we will talk this evening about circumstances where you might be reaching out to Audubon specifically, which is why on um, your ID badge, um, there's the Audubon cell phone number is one of the numbers on the ID badge. We'll talk specifically about when you might have to call Audubon. 
we're there. We are there. <laughs> All right, next slide, please. Oh, you're right there. Cool. Um, okay, so we talked a little bit about the incubation period. Um, so they won't incubate, they won't start until they have all four eggs, um, or if they're only going to do a three egg, until all of those eggs are in. Um, and the reason for that is because they want all of their young to hatch at the same time so that their clutch can kind of learn life together. Um, everybody's trying to sit on the nest, and I'm sure you guys know how that goes. Brad has twins, so he knows what it's like. Yeah, he's been telling you everywhere. Um, okay, so once the chicks hatch, they're quick to feed themselves. Um, they move around a lot. They're very vulnerable. Um, one thing that we do like to point out is that their natural instinct to predation is to freeze. Um, so don't step on them when they freeze. They're not injured. They're just doing their thing. Leave them alone, give them some space, and they will be okay. Um, a lot of people get really concerned when they see them freeze and they're like, oh, they must be injured. Pick them up, take them somewhere. Don't do that. They're fine. They're animals. They've been doing this for a long time. They are programmed, wired in their brain um, to know what they need to do. So it's it's not injured. Leave it alone, and it will make its way. I'll just interject on that topic. Every single year it doesn't matter. Every single year, sometimes, unfortunately, multiple times a year, some well-meaning kid picks one up, puts it in their pail, and brings brings it to a lifeguard or wherever and whenever. So um yeah Does that sort of typically die if that happens. No, in fact, uh last year, two years ago, uh the Sunday of July 4th weekend, um actually no, it was pre-COVID. It was uh, 19, 2019. Um we got a call. Um Laura, my wife who runs this program, um we got a call on Sunday night from Old Orchard Police Department. And actually it was from a state game warden. We got a call from the police department who got a bucket of four chicks, oh, no. all four, handed to a lifeguard, which made its way to the police department. So there's a bucket of chicks inside the police department now because we knew where did, first question, where were those chicks picked up? We knew it was, I don't remember, by Morrison Street, in Old, Old Orchard, okay. To the south or to the north? To the south, okay. So it's gotta be this brood, you know? So they were able to, Laura actually, my wife, left whatever we were doing on Sunday of July 4th weekend, went, drove to Old Orchard, uh, picked those chicks up. She knew where they were. The adults were still peeping looking oh, for their babies. This oh, was maybe two hours that elapsed too. And she, best, total best case scenario, this bitch, you know, dumped them out on the sand and swept them right up immediately, all four of them. Oh, so wow. that is absolutely best case scenario. Oh, it often doesn't end well in and, stress. Or, yeah. And the well-meaning child and putting them in the bucket, that is against the law to do anything like that yeah, with endangered don't species. Don't they don't know, no. And their parents, I guess, don't know. Um, but part of it, part of part of your role as a as a volunteer um, is to educate people about the birds and the fact that they are endangered species and that you cannot uh, like approach them, harass them, touch them. Like they you need to be entirely hands-off, even if um, and as volunteers, we're gonna get to this if you have the unfortunate circumstance of finding a dead bird on the beach, you are not to touch it um, seriously. And, seriously. And so we will, yeah, we'll talk about that as we, we move through this. Yes. Curious, if, you, if the birds, those little cool birds had been delivered someplace else, meet with well-meaning, um, would the parents, it wouldn't be their, it wouldn't be their parents, did they take care of the birds? Oh, if they were released like to a, a different a foster group, yeah, probably not. Yeah. In fact, last year, um, I don't know, have you gotten to the numbers slide yet? Okay. Uh, <coughs> I don't know if it's in this one. I think this is the basic, not the advanced. Okay. Um, so our populations, we're in a great spot right now in Maine, but not anywhere else. Maine and Massachusetts are basically carrying the whole Atlantic population. I've been. We've had 
record breaking years, both with pairs and the chicks fledged. So chicks raised to the point of being able to fly and off on their own. That's our metric of success is a fledged chick per pair. Uh, we've had the most of both of those numbers ever in the last four years. In fact, the population has doubled in Maine in the last uh, four years. And that's great, but it also comes with a lot of challenges. Worldwide pandemic, uh, a lot of people out on, more people out on the beaches, more people, more problems, more birds, more people, kaboom. Um, but we've also run into these interesting biological, ecological challenges, like uh, we call it density dependence. When there's too many of one thing competing for the same resources, they start fighting against each other. Um, one of the biologists last year witnessed on Western Beach uh, a neighboring adult or a, a, an adult killing a neighboring chick. Oh. Yeah, so that stuff definitely happens. So my thinking is that they would probably not really take in another chick, especially when they're this amped up to protect their own. <clears throat> And to that end, you'll see people that are like, well, I see these birds everywhere. There's so many of them. And because we are doing so well here in Maine, there are a lot of birds. But what you have to think is the second we stop doing any of this management, the numbers are gonna go back down. So the only reason we're seeing such success is because so many people like you guys are coming out and, and giving time and really caring about these birds. So when people say, well, there's so many, well, there's so many because we're doing a good job and we need to continue doing that. Sure. All right. so. Back to our birds here. Um, this is the broken wing display. Um, and I actually saw this today from a couple of birds while we were putting up an exclosure around and they, they'll drag their wing, they'll yell at you, they'll flap around. They're like, hey, look over here, look over here. Um, all the while they're trying to pull your attention away from their nest. So generally, if you see a bird doing this display, you're too close to the nest. Bottom line, you're too close to the nest, you're too close to their chicks, um, you're making it upset, you're making it uncomfortable, and you're putting it at risk for abandoning its nest. Um, so if you're seeing a, a broken wing display, you just need to back up, leave the bird alone, um, and, and let it go back to its young. Um, so the fledglings, these are once they can fly. Um, so you're going to have your chicks, they spend about 25 days foraging, learning the ropes, learning what life is like. Um, and then they can take off and fly, and they're going to follow their parents uh, back down to warmer climates. Mom leaves first, dad leaves about a week later, and then a week after that, the chicks kind of head down together. Um, so threats on the beach, we've already talked about some of these things. Um, habitat loss is one of the biggest issues, um, not just for the species, but for a lot of species. So there's fragmentation, people are developing on the beaches. Um, another issue that comes with that development, you're going to have more predators. You're going to have areas where they can hide under houses, garages. Um, you're going to have food. People are going to bring trash to the beaches. That's going to bring predation. Um, so just development around the beach in general is a huge threat for these birds. Um, and then there's also natural threats. Um, so we've been seeing a lot of fox and crow tracks specifically this spring. Uh, I think we're going to have a big issue with foxes, maybe not so much on the beaches here, Western, certainly. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think it's going to be a problem this year. We've seen a lot, a lot of fox tracks and, you know, that's just part of the natural world. So obviously we don't want them attacking clovers, um, but perhaps it's not as bad as somebody's domestic dog. Um, I guess that's kind of speculation, but um, so human disturbance, obviously another big threat. Uh, lots of people on the beach, people walking in management, um, and then tides and sea level rise are also an issue. Um, so I already talked a little bit about that big storm we had. Um, that storm pushed tides all the way up, some of them up into the dunes. Um, so if there had been chicks or um, or not chicks, I'm sorry, if there had been eggs in that storm, it's, it's very likely that they were washed. And that's okay, those birds will just pick up. Um, and that's often why you see some of our early birds with only three chicks or three eggs in their clutch. So we have a question from Zoom Land asking if the town will trap foxes and move them. And typically the town will not, IFNW may. 
No? We don't have funding for uh, our Scarborough beaches, unfortunately. We have efforts focused on a Gunkwit beach, which is our highest volume beach. Uh, it's not a state park, so unfortunately not. Okay. Which makes doing everything else outside of trapping the foxes. If you guys want to run around or tackle a fox and grab it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, I this is a, a double picture in here, but it's just showing the volume of guests that we see on a gunquit. Um, and I know that Higgins is a little bit quieter than a gunquit, certainly, um, but there's still going to be a ton of people. You guys know how it goes. Um, and a lot of people that are coming, they don't maybe know about the birds, they don't know about um, dog laws on the beach. So all of these things, you guys are the taxpayers, you're the people that live here in this town, this is your town year round. So you can certainly feel free to kindly explain those rules to people. Um, certainly education and outreach is a big part of this. So if you're you're kind in explaining that this, this is an endangered species and we're trying to protect them, most people will be um, accepting of that. So our job basically is to mingle with the people and explain to them about the birds, how we're trying to protect them. Mm -hmm. And so forth, right? Yes. It, yep. You know, the level of mingling is, is up to your personality, of course, but I always kind of you can gauge somebody who's interested or the pointing something out to their kids or yeah, actually gotta, stopping to read a sign. You don't want to get too pushy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And we um always say minimize confrontation. Like it is not. You guys are not the beach police. No, I'm not going to get to fight with it. Right. Well, and I'm just saying, but you may encounter some people on the beach who want to get in a fight with you. And if that's because post COVID people have like very few boundaries and are, um, and are amped up a lot of the time. So, um, as volunteers, we ask that you, um, kindly approach people if they are aggressive or if they don't want anything to do with you you walk away if they are doing something that um like if there's a uh, they've got a dog off leash or something like that um look at the numbers on the back of your um your id badge called dispatch um and they will send an officer down to the beach i'm not going to play police officers right it's not your job to be police officer you're that you guys are there for kind of like public relations and education um and just trying to inform people um and if there's a situation that you're uncomfortable with, you walk away because your safety is number one. Yes, we want to protect these birds, but like ultimately we want you all to be safe as well. My favorite was last year on Higgins. I'm sitting there, got my badge on, by the dog sign. People walk right by me with a dog. Woman looks up at the sign and says, not my dog. <laughs> like, <Yeah>. okay. <laughs> But once I approached her and I just, I, friendliness, just always, oh, hi, I'm a volunteer. And, you know, just wondering if you knew about this rule and about this species. And she asked, oh, really? Oh, I just didn't know. Like, <laughs> when you took care of that situation in a nice way. Yeah. You always start off nice. Yeah. And you always just assume that they didn't see the sign and that they want to do the right thing. And so you give okay. benefit of the doubt and all of that. And you don't want to come after people too, because we don't want everyone, the public associating these birds with mean people on the beach being like, stay away from these birds. <laughs> you know, we want people to enjoy them and they're constantly getting yelled at. Your dog can't be here. You can't walk in this. Your kids can't play here. You can't have your bike on the beach. They're going to associate these birds with being a nuisance from a certain point in the summer on. So we don't want to create that that feeling for people. We want them to enjoy the birds instead of feeling attacked every time they come to the beach. We want to keep those plovers taste like chicken bumper stickers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so something that we get a lot is people saying that these birds must be stupid and that's why they're endangered and that's why they can't get their numbers up. Um, but they're not. They're not stupid. They they're just adapted. This is part of their evolution. This is where they can live. They don't have options. They can't hop in a car and go out to the countryside. This is it. They get these dunes um, and that's where they can have their young. So they're not stupid. 
we're just we're in their territory. Um, yeah. So you can you can figure out a way to kindly say that to people if they're like, well, these birds must be stupid. You can kind of come up with your own little story about why they're not stupid and how humans have kind of affected them. And so that's why their numbers aren't strong right now. Um, okay, so what we are doing when you see our group out on the beach, um, we're monitoring much like you guys um, and we're doing outreach and education. Um, and we're also doing carrying these massive bundles of stakes out there, explosures, um, checking for scrapes, checking for eggs, making sure that any activity is really protected in that stake and twine. Um, so this is, I think, last year's crew out there hammering in. Um, basically, we take a sledgehammer and a stake, pound them in all along, and then we take a piece of twine and wrap it down the beach. Um, it makes it easy if we have to move management in and out. Um, it's a great system and we stick with that until we have a reason to explode a nest. Um, we just stick with the stake and twine simple management. It looks like pine point. Is that pine point? It could be. <laughs> so I actually think that picture is a couple years old. Yeah. yeah. Um, is that old orchard? Yeah. This is only my fourth year in Maine, so I don't so some, no, I thought of pine, I thought of pine point. Sometimes it's like a people put up a volleyball net, they're playing volleyball. So wonder if you come upon that there by this area. I mean, that's pretty busy activity. So did you have to approach them and like move the game? Yeah, the town has a, a beach management agreement that um, with IFNW that requires that the activities like that are away from managed areas. Um, I mean, and Pine Point's pretty big. So there are air, plenty of areas away for, and we don't often have many birds on Pine Point. So there are areas in, on other it's parts of the beach, of yeah, the parking area. Where, um, where stuff like that would be less of an issue. And also, that's, oh, sorry. Had those really nice signs last year on Higgins Beach about, please take your beach games elsewhere. Yeah, so um, Higgins, they, um, put out a variety of signs. And last year we had some made um, that say um, endangered birds ahead, please play beach games, run and ride your bike on other areas of the beach. Um, and those, they just kind of move based on where um, the, the birds are nesting and where they tend to go once the chicks are hatched. Um, we don't have as many po folks putting out signs and taking them off the beach at Pine Point and Ferry and Western. So we don't tend to have additional signage at those um, two beaches. Um, but Higgins, I think, has at least half of the number of, I said we have 70 volunteers signed up this year, at least half of them are um, will be working on Higgins this summer. That's where it helps in that circumstance with the volleyball net to know where your birds are, to get familiar if you're walking the same stretch of beach every day. All right, I got my two pair in the uh, restricted area on the way to the jetty at Pine Point. There's a one pair just before town line that way. Higgins, I've got my four or five pairs. And yeah, there's you, 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 you know, you get certainly a few walk it every day. Um, you definitely get to know where your birds are. And another fits, I don't know if you consider it a beach game. Um, we have an issue with kites. So the birds will see a kite and they will automatically think it's a predator. So if people are flying kites too close to their nesting areas, they're in danger of abandoning um, that site. So that's another thing. I mean, obviously volleyballs, if it bounces and goes into management and something happens, um, but there are certainly other reasons the birds really get frightened of shadows kind of flying over for obvious reasons. Yeah, kites and drones and things like that are supposed to be 650 feet away from um, managed areas. A lot of kite surfers on Pine Point, mm -hmm. Western, and that area is great for them. But I always try to chat with them when I see them, especially if the tides tides up. And I think the um, the person who runs up the surfers union or the kite surfers union reached out um, to talk to Laura Williams about a good place for them to stage their their surfing away from management. So there they know. Um, that the birds are there and that group of people is trying to be active to disturb them as little as possible, which is great. Um, all right, these cute little things here. 
Um, best thing that everybody can do on the beach, public, you guys, everyone, um, walk a little bit slower, look where you're going to step and listen. If you're getting close to them, they're going to start yelling at you. You've all heard them. Beep, 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 beep. Um, the louder and the faster it gets, the closer you're probably getting to them or to their, their area. Um, so just look for them, listen for them. They're out there. Um, and watch, watch where you're stepping. <laughs> Um, okay, so we have the imposter cousin, the kill deer. Um, also very cute. Obviously, uh, we don't want bad things to happen to kill deer either, um, but they're not pokers. They're not endangered. They're not our species of interest. Um, people often mistake them, but uh, they're a little bit different. And um, again, we don't, we don't want bad things to happen to them, but if you're seeing these chicks, this isn't our, our point of focus. So. And do they have the same nesting area? Um, killdeer are weird. They may nest on the beach. They also might just nest in the middle of a parking lot or um, <laughs> wherever, basically. You will undoubtedly come across folks on the beach that say, I live in Wyndham and we've got those things out there. Okay. It's these guys. But they have two black stripes on the neck. They're taller, slightly uh, bigger. Um, yeah, parking lots, ball fields. <laughs> Because I know they have a broken leg. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so earlier you heard me talking about seeing crow tracks and fox tracks. Um, only when tracking is good on the beach. So after storms or when it's really windy, it's difficult to see this stuff. But you can see uh, where predators are. Um, today on Higgins, there was a crow right outside of one of the exclosures. There were also crow tracks everywhere all over the beach. So it's good that we have those three nests enclosed to keep the crows out. Um, if something happens to one of the nests and you see a lot of crow tracks or fox tracks, obviously you don't have concrete evidence, but you may know that that, that was a, a victim of predation rather than um, a victim of human influence. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of the rules for driving vehicles on your beaches. I assume that only public servants yeah. are able to do that. Um, we do ask that people have spotters. If they're going to take vehicles on the beach, keep them down at the intertidal zones, walk really slow. Um, just because you have a spotter doesn't mean that you can stop paying attention to what you're doing. Um, and then just keep the vehicles. I mean, I don't think any of you guys will be driving on the beach at all, but keep them down in the intertidal zones, keep them away from the dunes, keep them away from management and nesting birds. What about <clears throat> beach bikes? I think Same. the the So they're supposed to be 650 feet away from management as well. Okay. And I do know some of the beaches. I don't know if any of the ones here at Scarborough, some beaches say no bikes at all. You can't bring it down there at all. Um, I think that's more of a state park thing, but I was going to say we do not have that that rule in place. Yeah. Okay. But again, yeah, if people are down there biking, hopefully they're watching where they're going, and hopefully they're away from management. But yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, a little more kind of redundant. What I just said to you guys: intertidal zones, use a spotter. Don't quit paying attention just because somebody's watching for you. Um, and then I talked about this a little earlier um, about how the chicks freeze when they're scared. Um, adults won't do this as much. They'll kind of flush out of the way. Um, but if the chicks feel like they can't move away from you fast enough, their best defense is to just stop what they're doing and hope that you don't see them. Um, but we hope that you do see them and, and don't step on them, please. Often in footprints, too, you'll see the chicks. Yeah, because they can sit down in there, get a little windbreak, a little protection. Um, okay, so this is, we're going to talk about what a take is. And I don't know if any of you guys have heard this term before, um, but a take of an endangered species is federally illegal, and people will be prosecuted for this. Um, so it means harass, harm, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, kill, trap, capture, collect, or even to attempt in any of these activities. Um, I don't know how far prosecutions have gone in the past, but I do know that people have been in trouble. Either their dog has done something 
I don't know if we've gone after anybody whose children have done it. Um, I know there were some volunteers at Wells who were really gung-ho to see some, some prosecutions happen so that people would know um, that we're serious, but it is, it's a federal crime. So you might want to remind people if their dog is chasing a bird, hey, I know your dog doesn't chase plovers, but this is, this is a crime. And if you get caught, you're going to get prosecuted. Um, and oftentimes that's enough to to make people turn around or put their dog on a leash. It doesn't even have to be a plover. If a dog is flushing a gull, mm -hmm. gulls are still protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Mm -hmm. So technically that's a violation of a federal violation as well. And that, I find that that always gets people's, mm -hmm. oh, really? Yeah, can't chase wildlife. There's only three species of birds that are exempt for that. And if they're all exotic species, House sparrows, pigeons, and uh, starlings. So, <laughs> so technically, everything else has some level of protection. Okay. Um, so we have had some unfortunate issues on our beaches in the past while we've been doing this project. Um, domestic animals have been a problem. So there was a dog that killed a piping, piping plover, I believe, Scarborough State Park. Pine Point. The, Pine Pine Point. Oh, that was Pine Point. Okay, um, I know Pine Point was on here on the next slide. It's pointed out again. Um, obviously, if somebody sees that happen, uh, we can we can do a little more. Um, but sometimes, if there's no nobody to witness, it's really difficult for us to find a dog or a dog owner or a responsible party for this. Um, and then domestic cats are also an issue. So people let their cats out um, and they head down to the beach and take chicks or harass adults or both. Um, and a lot of times people don't think that that's what their cat is doing when they let them out the door. But as a cat owner who keeps their cat inside, I promise you, your cats are going outside and they're killing wildlife, whether it's clovers or um, just your backyard birds. So something for everybody to think about. Um, and then we talked about kids putting their, putting chicks in a bucket and bringing them to lifeguards. Um, I think there was an example of somebody who put a chick in their pocket. Um, and Mom's obviously, purse. yeah, obviously those situations, it's very, very unlikely uh, that you're going to have a living chick after something like that. So yeah, we don't want that to happen. Um, and, you know, it does. At the end of the day, if a child does something like that, it will make a good education example for them um, so that maybe in the future they're they're not as likely to mess with the wild animal. Um, but it's obviously something we want to avoid altogether. And I don't think I need to tell you guys about the chicks freezing again, because that will be the third time we've talked about it. Um, so and then uh, the fencing that we put up, steak and twine. Um, we've had disruptions with that. Um, I believe there's been disruptions with the exposures enough to the point where um, the adults have left the nest. And once the adults abandon, they're not coming back for their eggs. Um, so basically all of their efforts that they put in for this year are moot point. Um, so you did say you guys do have a beach agreement, which is awesome. So that helps. Um, with the public work stuff that gives the guidelines per town um, how to deal with the take. Um, and then it also allows the town so that they can go do things without having to call us every single time. Like, hey, we want to take a vehicle on the beach. Is that OK? Um, so we've already kind of made that agreement ahead of time that they know the appropriate way to bring vehicles on the beach um, and the appropriate channels to take care of, of issues like a take. Um, okay, so this is important for you guys. This is the incident protocol if you see something actively on the beach, um, if you come up on a, a scene. Um, so technically, it is a crime scene because this is a, a federally endangered species. Um, so just like you wouldn't walk up to a murder scene and move the body, don't walk up to the scene and move a bird. Um, it makes it a lot easier for us if we can see everything that happened, we can look at tracks, we can see if it was natural predation, we can see if there's human influence, 
Um, but as soon as those things are disturbed, it makes it a lot more difficult for us to get a real idea of what happened there. Um, so if any of you guys do come on this unfortunate situation, what we would like you to do is start calling people. The first person would be Jamie. Um, you can leave her voicemail, but if you do not talk to her, she does not pick up the phone, continue to call down the chain until you get somebody on the phone. Um, we're busy. Brad's in his basement. He might not have service. We're out on the beach. We might not have service. Um, and we're not all the best at checking our voicemails. So <laughs> if you guys could just continue to call until you get somebody, um, get somebody on the line and they can pass that on to us and then we can get the appropriate people out there on the beach. So we should go up a chain of command on the back of this stuff. Uh... Yes, I do believe that that is in order of who you would want to call. Yeah, I mean, you're definitely going to get, um, get someone if you call Scarborough Police Dispatch, um, and then they would then probably call the warden service. Um, but I would say the, the top two or the top numbers to call on here would be me and the Audubon's um, Clover hotline. Um, and if you've tried both of those numbers a couple times and you don't get a response, then I would call police dispatch. So if we know where these nests are from going down the beach, mm -hmm. and we just come up, we don't, we only report something if we see that someone is there and it's a nest. Yeah, if you see um, a dead bird on the beach, then you would call someone um, immediately and continue calling until you get a human on the phone um, that can get that message and then continue working to get to the appropriate Okay, um, so it's person. not just to say someone is bothering the nest. No, no. No, it's if, if there's a dead adult, dead chick, if you can see um, there are four eggs in, and they're all crushed, you know, mm -hmm. something like that that's when you're gonna to wanna to call us. And the um, the Plover hotline, one of us has that phone with us all the time. So we pass it around weekly. We have it on the weekends, we have it at night. Um, if we're awake and the phone is around us, even if it's after hours, we'll do our, our very best to answer that. Um, if not, definitely leave a voicemail on that line and, and somebody will check it. Thank you. Yes. And when you say please dispatch, do you mean 911 or the non-emergency? The non-emergency number. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, and you know that'll bring the same as nine one one. They'll just know that it's not someone whose life is in danger. Um, and if you have your cell phone with you and you come upon this, take photos of the area, um, document as as much as you can, um, take notes in your observation sheet. If you, you know, having as much information as possible will be um, really helpful in these situations. I also want to share that I believe um, there will be, um, they're working, Audubon is working on coordinating uh, law enforcement training. So if people are interested in more information about what to do in this, fortunately, it's a fairly unlikely circumstance um, that you will find a, a dead plover or other animal on the beach. Um, they are work, going to be doing um, another training coming up um, with the warden service and local police if, if you're interested in learning more and having more information about what you might need to do in these situations. And so once I have that information, I will share that all with you and it will be up to you whether you want to attend or not. Um, and like Jamie said, take pictures, write down what you see. If you can stay at the scene until somebody shows up, that is what we would prefer. Um, if for whatever reason you can't do that, if you go into your phone, a lot of your maps apps, Google Maps or um, Apple Maps will show you a latitude and longitude coordinate. Um, so if you guys could at least, if you do have to leave the scene, at least get the latitude and longitude for us so that we can find exactly where that site is quickly, efficiently, and easily. Okay, so the things not to do, um, and this is not just for incident protocol, this is in general. Don't put yourself at risk. Never put yourself at risk. Obviously, we love these birds, we wanna protect them, um, but human safety is first and foremost over the birds. So if your instinct is telling you that this is not a good situation, then it's probably not. Um, don't put yourself at risk. Don't touch the birds, dead or alive. 
um, leave them where they're at so that we can get as much information as we can. Obviously, if they're living, definitely don't touch them. Um, we want to leave them alone and then don't interfere with the scene of the crime. Just take your notes, take your pictures, get your coordinates um, and give us a call. So that is everything from me, um, besides my thanks to all of you guys for everything that you're doing. Uh, we really do appreciate it. We could not do what we're doing without you guys. So I appreciate you guys coming here after work. Um, appreciate you guys going out on the beach, walking around, volunteering your time. I know Brad and Laura really appreciate you guys. So thank you for being here. And thank you for doing everything. And I'm sure that the birds say thank you too. I'm trying to figure out what's going on with that last picture. And what are all those people doing? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Standing outside of management, which is a good start. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm unsure. All right. I don't, know. I don't know. We'll have to look into that later. Grab a couple questions. Back. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you talked about the scratch areas where they're making nests. Do you have some pictures of what that looks like? Because that's going to be something that's fairly subtle. Yeah, well, you have a really good one from um, Old Orchard. Yeah, let sure somebody and what that looks like. Way like, way like <laughs> I'm trying to think about the others on that screen. I don't think there are any of this. I didn't see you show any of it in the stack. I thought that they give access to your email. Yeah. yeah, if you want to email it to me, I will. I can pull it up. Um, there is a slide, slide number four. Oops. A mess. Um, so essentially a scrape, it's almost going to look like a footprint in the sand, like the toe part of a footprint. And there's often times where like, oh, there's one. And no, it's just a footprint. Um, <laughs> So really what they do is the male goes up and he kind of shoves his belly down and then he kicks the sand uh, yeah. away and kind of makes that little indentation. Without the yeah. yeah, and so a lot of the time coming up to a scrape, you'll see all their little the tracks coming up. Um, so that's a good sign that it's more than just a footprint. Um, you can see fresh, I like to call them toe marks, but it's really their little claws um, okay. kind of pulling the sand out. It's not really true. That's a least turn mess on the upper left. So this one is a least turn for for those zooming. <laughs> and remember this how I said the least turn. turns, they don't really they this don't scrape. The they just kind of like, yeah, this spot's good. We'll drop that there. Um, where the plovers will go find a little protection from the wind or the elements, um, protection from the sun, and they'll scrape underneath in those areas. I wish we had a better picture of just a scrape. And Oftentimes, because this happens within the stake and twine area, we as volunteers aren't going to see it. Um, it's really going to be the folks who are allowed to go inside the stake and twine um, that are going to be the ones seeing that. And that might be something that we didn't touch on um, enough in this is that even though um, you all have been through this training and are volunteers for the town, you still need to stay outside of the stake and twine area. Um, it's only people who work for Maine Audubon, IFNW, or have been specifically trained and given authorization to go inside the stake and twine area that should be inside there. Yeah, that's, that's what I was thinking is that if it was, uh, you know, something something's happened beyond it, that would be the indication to let you know. Absolutely. Yeah. So what about the turns doing something? Are we supposed to let you know about the turns? So I'm not sure if this was brought up or not. I've been in, in and out a couple of times, but Least terns are colonial nesters, so they nest in big numbers. At Higgins, there was a colony last year. And you'll, know, you'll know when they're in and aggressive. And they'll let you know. They're, we say they're effective communicators because they'll swoop down, they'll have the uncanny accuracy to poop on your head. Um, I've had blood drawn by terns before. They'll, yeah, they're very noisy. Um, Higgins is one place where almost every year we have to adjust our management because there's a scrape right outside the stake and twine or uh, western sometimes too. So if you're a volunteer on one of those beaches, you very well could come across a scrape. I remember Laura telling a story a couple years ago where on Wells Beach, they decided to nest right in the middle of a public access point to mm -hmm. Wells Beach. Mm -hmm. That was during 2020. Um, so they showed up during the shutdown 
and there's this beautiful stretch of sand down by the jetty and they were like oh this is so lovely uh they opened beaches back up people started coming and people got really really upset that they had to walk around this nest I, oh, such, but a, at the same I know, time, so, such an inconvenience the right? town was such a great partner because they shut that jetty pathway if anyone's oh, yeah, familiar yeah, with yeah, the wells yeah. jetty yeah. pathway it was such a weird spot it's actually in kind of shells and cobble right um, by the harbor yeah right the by harbor the, harbor. the jetty yeah like they literally had yeah. the, the birds had to walk 100 feet yeah. just to get to the yeah. high tide yeah. yeah um but yeah that was a circumstance where having volunteers and great partnerships with the town they actually put jersey barrier up at the parking lot and made people go down the next nearest access point Yep. So 650 feet, what's that visually? I'm no clue. I'm not good with numbers. How far is that? I know. And where is, is, is it like from? It's like two football fields. <laughs> we're, not, we're not going to expect folks to yeah. really enforce that. You kind of know. Yeah, it's a football field about 100 yards. 100 yards. Yeah. So, it's a lot. So it's, it's a long distance. <coughs> it's a very long distance. That comes from federal fish and wildlife, US Fish and Wildlife Service guidelines and that comes from studies or research studies that were done about dis uh, disturbance and how close certain activities can be to birds uh, without so kicking from them off the nest, nest. So, from the nest, so not the enclosure don't get me started on plant points but um, it was uh that was a that's compromise that's area Well, depending on how much time you want to spend out there, so it's typically about an hour. Mm -hmm. um, you can stay more or less depending on what your availability is. Um, typically, volunteers will do one full kind of walk of the beach, um, and we're not we can't be there all the time. No one can be there all the time, mm -hmm. so it's it's really a snapshot of when you're there and catch and catch can when you're you're out there and you see people out there. So um, when I'm when I go, I typically on Pine Point, um, well, and it all depends on where the nests are also. Mm -hmm. So um, Pine Point, we sometimes have some um, not too far from um, the, the parking lot down in, at Herd Park, down towards the jetty, mm -hmm. because that's where um, the habitat is that is conducive for them to build their nests, mm -hmm. scrape their nests, I should say. Um, and then um, sometimes down closer to the OOB line. So it might be mm -hmm. walking up one way, down the other and coming back. Um, and that would, would be your time on the beach. Um, a great <laughs> yeah, I mean, you get you get to enjoy the outdoors, get some good exercise. It's an excuse to go to the beach. Um, and with on Ferry and Western Beach, I will park in the municipal lot, walk around the corner and go down Western because that is typically where, where the birds nest um, and, and come back. And I, and with Higgins, I believe, um, so Higgins, it's, it's a little bit different because they do have volunteers putting out signs and taking them in with the turns of the tide so that the, the restricted area is, is more visible. Um, so they'll have some folks doing signs and then and others will be walking down to the Swirling River, um, checking on the nests, counting the, the birds because people are just interested, like how many birds can I spot when I'm out there? Have, do we have any new chicks on the beach? Um, and talking to people. Um, and again, I can't emphasize enough, your role as an educator. So you're there to um, give information to people, um, tell them what our ordinances and our rules are, but you're not gonna enforce them. You have no authority to enforce them. And if it's um, an, a, a situation um, where, you know, it's birds are in danger, there's a dog loose and the people aren't trying to get them under control or, or anything like that, you call police dispatch. Um, and, and hopefully they will be able to send um, an officer down. I know um, that there is going to be a reserve officer that is dedicated to, to Higgins for at least part of his time. So he will be there um, more frequently. Um, I heard Chris Krebs was hurt. I have not heard that, but 
So Chris Preps is our animal control officer. So oftentimes um, if you call dispatch, he'll, he's the one that they will send down to deal with like dog issues and, and things like that. Um, but if he's hurt, maybe not. Like you know, I'm talking about for uh, reporting things that we can see online and things like that. I really kind of explain that at all. Uh, number two, do you ever have little uh, pamphlets or little flyers that you could say, well, you know, just take this and read this when you get a chance to do something like that? Number three, do you guys ever do any like uh, personal training of us? Uh, go out with us and say, hey, this is it, right? This is wrong. These are do's, these are don'ts. Um, number one, I will answer the online reporting is only going to be for your time and miles and, and your volunteer yes. documentation, which we'll get into in a little in just bit. A minute. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I did mention that there are, we have observation forms. So I'm going in the update that I send next week, it will have um, a cop a PDF of that file that you can print out if you want to um, take your notes um, by hand. Um, it will also have a link to an online form if you prefer to, to fill it out online. And it's really just like, you're going to tell me who you are, what beach you're at, the approximate time that you were there and the date that you were there. And then just some general observations. I saw X number of birds. I saw X number of dogs. Um, these are the, the interactions that I had with people. Um, that's it. And then if there's anything, like if you have any negative interactions um, or anything that we should be aware of, um, I would ask that you either send me an email or give me a phone, give me a call um, so that we, I'm aware of it sooner rather than later um, because I'm, I'm not necessarily going to go in and look at the online form every day to see what kind of observations um, you all are reporting. But if there's something that I need to know about, I would ask that you send me an email or give me a call. Um, we do have the um, sharing the beach with shorebirds um, brochures, and I can print off a handful of those um, if, if you would like. Uh, we try to minimize what we hand out to people on the beach because it often becomes litter. Um, there are informational signs on the beach about the plovers. There's big yellow signs um, that have were given to us by Audubon and IFMW um, that has information about the birds, their life cycle, where they are, um, why we're we're doing this program, um, and things like that. And was there one more thing that you asked that I'm not remembering? Trainings, and oh. just to add to that a little bit too, Audubon has a ton of documents, you know, little pamphlets and guides. And the, um, the website is a great place to direct to the people website, too, just so mainautobahn.com. We have yeah, all the temporary tattoos for kids. Mm -hmm. They yeah. do tend to do later on in the summer when there are chicks, like kind of in July to try to get a peak of folks outreach events. So they'll go put a table up at Pine Point right at the entrance there and chat with folks as they're coming in and out. It's been kind of hard to do that the last couple of years, but um, they try to focus on areas where number one, there's birds. Mm -hmm. Number two, you get a high volume of folks going in and out. Pine Point's pretty good for that. Old Orchard's very tough because every street's got an access point. Um, but yeah, those types of things do happen and they'll have coloring books and there's all kinds of stuff like that. Bandanas for good dogs oh. that stay on their leash. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, if people are interested in doing kind of a a field workshop and a field training. Um, Audubon has offered um, that we can do another kind of optional um, training where we'll actually go to one of our beaches and they will um, point out kind of the birds. I, I have to tell you, they, we, I can't emphasize enough how well they camouflage because my first year there, or first year in Scarborough, I was on the beaches. I'm like, I'm not seeing any birds anywhere. You and I went out the sand long enough. And we right. Close. And I went out with, um, <laughs> with Laura and she's like, yep, there's one there and there's one there and there's one there. I was like, okay, I hadn't seen any of those. <laughs> so it is helpful to have your eye trained. So if that is an interest to folks, um, we can work on coordinating that. Um, and and for, I would say probably once chicks have hatched because that's super exciting. It's just, you know, see the little cotton balls on toothpicks running around the beach. <laughs> and if you bring your binoculars to the beach, yes. you're much more likely to see the birds and be able to give them that safe distance too. You'll be able to see them running along the intertidal zone. Um, I know Higgins, if you're outside of management, you can still see mom and dad, whoever's on the nest, actively incubating within their enclosure. 
Um, you can see it with the naked eye, but if you bring your binoculars, you'll really be able to, to feel like you're up in that action without disturbing the bird at all and getting to her space. Yeah, how many hours from now to dusk are there actually volunteers out there? I thought it was going to be like everything and oh, here's my relief coming. It's not constant. Yeah. It absolutely isn't constant. And um, typically, so I try to have people on the beach during um, the, the change over time from when dogs are allowed on the beach to when they're not allowed on the beach. So okay. like 9 a.m. is that sweet spot when um, when that's when our, our restrictions change. And so dogs need to be off of our beaches um, after 9 a.m. Um, and then we also have, um, have them in like the afternoon evening hours um, because, you know, folks coming after work and, and things like that. So um, it is my goal to have a volunteer on the beach every day, um, but we're not going to have all, you know, 14, 16 daylight hours covered. That's, that's not um, manageable for anyone. Um, and so, which is why, you know, having, we're trying to get information out um, in, you know, the town, the newspaper and the town newsletter and on social media. So people know that we're going to be out there and we're going to be talking to them and so that they know what their restrictions and things are. People are always going to ignore them. Um, and so it's just, a, we can only do the best that we can. And the fact that we have 70 volunteers signed up is huge. Um, it's a huge help. Um, stuff is still going to fall through the cracks because we can't be there all the time. Hopefully Brad's okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> so there are a couple of slides that were, you know, had some good information on it. Could you send those out as PDFs? Because I'm going to have to nerd out with a clipboard because otherwise I won't remember anything that I have seen. So I to yes, I can. Um, down, I can. can wait I know. can share this information, and um, I will say a lot of it is in that the sharing the beach with shorebirds um, brochure that was sent last week. Um, in the kind of the initial email and I can I'll resend that as well um, if people missed it the first time around um, and if you do want some copies of that you can let me know and I'll have copies made up in um, in they can be picked up in the planning office which is in the basement of this building um, but like I said we do try to minimize what we hand out on the beach because it's, right. it's right. likely right. going to become a letter yeah, yeah. So I can say hey did you know I know I'm going to just start um, another set a, a duplicate question, but I'm a volunteer for Pine Point. So when I park in the parking lot, I would tend to go left because that's where I saw when we first moved here. The area is already cordoned off. Yep. So is that the, the path I should take, or would you say to go the other way as well? Because I don't normally see it the other way. It depends on where they are. And so, so okay. um, I, I will try to give that information in the updates. Yeah. Okay. So it's you your, it's a pretty safe bet. We typically know where they're going to be on Higgins and we know where they're going to be on Western. Okay. Pine Point is a little bit more of a crapshoot. They can oh. either be like in in the um, the conservation area to the, the left um, of the parking area or down near the border with okay. Old Orchard Beach. Okay. Yeah, and and sometimes they will nest on Old Orchard Beach, and once the chicks hatch, they'll move up into the Pine Point area and decide that that's where they're going to hang out because it's too crazy down in Old Orchard. <laughs> so um, they they are mobile. <laughs> this is just a Higgins specific question, probably for you, Brad. Do you know if there's going to be any signage this year at the wherever folks are putting in kayaking at Sperling River? And then marching across the beach. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we usually try to put some signs up there. Um, our the direction. Right? Yeah, for when they're coming. Okay. On. To yeah. be fair, yeah. before I knew about pluckers at all, I do use the spur wing to paddleboard. You can see everything. The signs are very obvious. The management is very obvious. In fact, that was one of the first cues to me that I was like, "Oh, there's something happening." I'm new in Maine, what's going on on these beaches? Um, and that was kind of my opening to figuring out what's going on with these birds. We're working so on People can see it. Yeah, it's it's just a matter of them wanting to, yeah. to read it and pay attention. Which... They're marching down the beach with their dog. And I'm like, you're not supposed to be here. Oh, look, but we're just, we're just we're going from here to there. Like, yeah. no, you're not supposed to be yeah, here. That's a no yeah. problem, Carita. Yeah. Thank you. 
there any more questions before um, I turn this over to Brad so that he can walk us I'm through? I'm going to take a quick little break. Anyone? Should we just keep powering through? All right. All right. All right. Well, this will be um, the last thing that we have to do this evening. So everyone, thank you for um, your great questions um, and for taking the time. So Brad, I will give you my seat okay. if you want to walk through. So we're on Zoom as well? Yes. Okay. Zoom should be able to, uh, hold on. Let me move this so that they can actually see what's happening on, on the screen. So you'll have to navigate by looking. Cursor. So while Jamie is uh, setting this stuff up, um, I'm just going to backtrack a little bit and hit on something she brought up at the very beginning. Um, I was a regional biologist, which meant I did a little bit of everything in Southern Maine for almost nine years. And I transitioned to the shore, uh, working statewide as a shorebird biologist last year. And um, I really, I, I always knew the value of volunteers to our department, but it really, really struck home this year when I've had to do a lot of the administrative type stuff that my predecessor used to do. So the way our department works, is very different from any other department in state government. And this is the same for every state's wildlife agency. We get federal funds called uh, Wildlife Restoration Act funds or Pittman-Robertson Act is uh, the act of Congress. Literally, we get millions of dollars a year in funding just in Maine. There's this huge federal pot that people pay into for hunting equipment, licenses, bird watching, you know, binoculars. There's a whole list of things um, that go into this big federal pot. Every single year, the federal government distributes based on geographical area of the state and population of the state, some magical formula. Those are the two big criteria. And they determine a percentage for how, what percent of that federal pot gets distributed to each state. So every single gets, every single state gets money. Almost 90% of inland fisheries and wildlife's budget comes from those federal funds. Um, so I'm the rare person when somebody is mad at me and they say, I pay your salary. It's, do you buy a license or do you buy equipment? Um, and that raises a lot of people's, wow, really, radar. Um, so that's really pretty interesting. In order for us to receive those federal funds, and last year it was like $5 million to fund our department's work and research, we have to match a quarter of that. 25% of those federal funds. Um, that can be through in-kind services like volunteer hours, mileage, paid the equivalent at a federal rate. So we're talking about like how important it is to document this volunteer time and money to our department and ultimately to the Python Club. And plovers generate so much match that it pays for its own program just from volunteers. So you guys are indirectly, directly uh, paying for the management of this endangered species by your services out there and Thanks, able guys. to hire fabulous seasonal staff as well. And Laura Williams full time now. So, um, and those dollars are only going up and up and up. Um, but in order for us to get that money, we have to do the fun administrative stuff that includes all of those archaic forms that you guys used to have to fill out. So all that stuff coupled with the fact that our department went through a once every five year federal audit this year. And they said, how are you reporting your time for the plumber program again? Well, I get my data sheets as I have for 12 years from my town coordinators, volunteer coordinators, and I give them to an admin person and that's all I see from them. So no, 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 you can't be doing that. We can't use that time. We need to 
enter it on a more frequent interval. So hence this, um, if any of you are uh, familiar with any of our other citizen science programs like the Loon, Pro Loon Project, uh, the Heron Observation Network, um, what's the other, uh, main bird atlas, we're in our fifth year of uh, bird atlasing this year. They've all moved to this online uh, form and time submission thing. Uh, so I, with the help of um, a wildlife biologist in our department, who's also quite savvy as a computer programmer, um, developed this form. The idea with this is that it's going to phase out all of those paper forms. And will be able to submit your time on a semi-regular basis. And I know that's gonna freak a lot of people out about computers and technology or keeping track and stuff like that. However, we do have some ideas on how to get around that. Um, as I start walking through that, um, I'll get into that a little bit more, but if you're, what I really don't wanna happen is for this to be prohibitive to folks being an official volunteer. So uh, it's just not worth entering my time. I'll just walk the beaches on my own time. I really want everybody to stay official because then we can record your time, for hours, money. Somebody on Higgins alone last year. Hi, Jenny, if you're on there. Uh, worked over 200 hours last summer. And Glenis, I know, works that kind of volume too. We're talking about thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of dollars contributing to this program. So uh, hopefully that little pitch there keeps everybody interested in signing up with this. Oh, okay. So yes, you'll have to look on the screen to see what you're Where's doing. my cursor? <laughs> yeah. Slide all the way to it. It's like an extension of the screen. So I like how he leads it. This very easy computer program. Where's yeah. my cursor? Yeah. It's <laughs> Next. The barrier okay. here is the fact that we are sharing screens and multiple screens and online and all of that. So I'm going to need a guinea pig. Would you like to be my guinea pig? Yeah. So we're going to register. What's your name? Tina. Tina. We're going to register Tina here first. Every single one of these has a little... Uh, Instruction, informational sheets, very, very simple, meant to be very simple. That said, it's literally been in three different versions in the last couple of weeks. <laughs> and the last training we did uh, necessitated another form. So that, uh, that was in Wells a couple of weeks ago. So there's gonna be hiccups, I know there are, and that's okay. And you guys, the users, hopefully, um, might see things. Like Jamie said, just let me know. Oh, go to this page. It's not allowing me to put this in. So we're going to run into those issues, um, hopefully less and less frequently. But um, anyways, we're on, on the registration page. We're going to enter Tina's email. TM Rue. T M R U E L at Gmail. And this will be your R U E L. I think you put in an extra R U E L. Okay. So. At Gmail.com. This will be your sign in for the future. And also a way that um, if you're having problems or if you're on vacation or really don't want to use a computer, you just send it to Jamie or me and we'll have some kind of administrative capabilities as long as we know your phone number and your email address. Hey, Brad, since this is going to be on YouTube, can we use my work email and my work oh, phone number sure. for this? Yeah, good, good call. Yeah. So Jay Fitch. Oh. That's our, yeah, it's right there. It's our domain. That's a great idea. Yeah. Okay, so here's where things start to get interesting. It's not gonna like that one in there. It wants it 10 digits only, but it does have to have an area code. It can be with dashes, it can be with parentheses, it can be all in one consecutive chain, okay? 
There's Jamie. There's only one option on here. I should mention too that another one of the Audubon biologists, uh, Amanda, um, had so has some program that she's working on, where she it basically takes a snapshot of each one of these pages and has a little description sheet. And we'll make sure that gets out to folks. It comes in a PDF form, so you can actually like have a manual essentially or a guidebook. But it really is pretty simple. It's, it's meant to be very easy. There's only one option in here right now. If you're interested, this satisfies all that reporting stuff. I do have a bunch of business cards here. I'll leave um, as well, seeing my phone number up there. And I'm happy to have folks call me anytime too. Um, that is my phone number. If you don't want to write it down now, just grab a card. Um, but all of it, this is just for you guys, that's all that information on those volunteer forms to satisfy the federal uh, reporting. All right, so we'll put Jamie in here. Yeah, and this is handy because she's very <laughs> yeah. You don't have to put an organization in here if you don't want to, that's entirely optional. Uh, most folks won't. This is this is required. This um, emergency uh, contact, which was on those forms as well. So we'll get Jamie's emergency contact. Oh, I'm sorry, I was out of the room. Did I miss a form? No. So Brad is just saying that um, the forms that used to be on paper that all the volunteers filled out, it's now online. So it's just all the same information that has already been. Well, maybe I can understand that. You send that to my uh, email address. Mm -hmm. And I can do it online from mm -hmm. that. Yep. All right. Yep. I can probably figure that out. All right. Yeah. And so, and <laughs> you will all receive an email from me with this information and instructions. So I that's just one email. I'm stable. All right. So, um, so for these forms, um, once it's it's ready for everyone to enter their information in. And um, and Brad sends me um, the the instructions for registering and all of that. I will send that out to everyone else. But we're just kind of walking it through it so you'll have a little bit of something to jog your memory from um, when it's time to. I'm seeing um, a QA here. I will, uh, Ronald, thank you for that question. Um, I will get you guys, this is not official for rollout yet because uh, we're still going through some uh, back and forth with the programmer here. Um, but rest assured that once. Um, I hope you guys can hear me uh, online there. Rest assured that once I do have an address to get out, we will send that out to you folks. Yeah, so once it's ready, you'll get an email from me with the link for, for accessing the forms and the instructions, um, and then you'll be able to walk okay. through. Um, How do you get your cursor back there? Oh, <laughs> slide it, go all the way to the right, like an extension of the screen. Go all the way off the screen. I don't even see it on there. I'm in your same boat, dude. <laughs> all right, we need Jamie's contact info. Um, all right, well, I'm going to give you my work emergency contact. Okay. So Angela Blanchett. Is she the engineer? She is. She's my supervisor. Oh, you're in the department. <laughs> All right. You know. uh, so we'll do 730 uh, 4040. All right. We'll just keep that alternate phone number if needed. And here's previously you had to, have, there was a section in the forms where you had to choose whether or not you were using your own insurance all state volunteers are covered under a policy with IFNW. Um, if you choose to be covered under that policy, but you're only covered if you get hurt on the job, if you're signed up as an official volunteer. So there's more reasons. <coughs> um, so do you want to be enrolled or your own? Most, I'd say most people use their own, but um, and, and I usually recommend that people do enroll because it's kind of like workers' compensation is how I, I view it. 
Okay. And there's no extra. There's no fee or anything. Oh, no, no, absolutely not. Yep. So again, that pre all these pages, you should only have to do once when you register. Just the one time. Yep. Yeah. So now you'll it's you know, it takes a couple minutes the first time. And then all you should have to do, and we'll test this once we get Jamie signed up. Um, I'm going to assume that she's agreeing agree. to this and submit her registration. Now, and that says at the beginning, congratulations, thank you for being a volunteer. So now she can submit her timesheet. You'll be guided through the process of entering a timesheet record, enter as many records as you need to if you have been keeping track of your time over the last month, you know, four hours here, two hours there, so on and so forth. You can do that. Right, here's that part. Um, was that no, the? No, it's the start. No, the next one down. There you go. So we don't report one. our time every time we're on the beach, do we? That's um, we, yeah, we would like to have that information because that um, generates a lot of. It basically leverages money for this program. So each time we go on the beach, we come back and log it in. Or once a week or every two weeks or every month, just make a little note on personal calendar, one hour here, you know, that type of stuff. Well, this is, I'm sorry. Sorry? Whether it's our shift or not. Whether it's your, your official shift or not. If you're on the beach, um, you're wearing your badge, you're talking to people, even if it's outside kind of the, your regular time, you can count that. Towards yeah, this. all of that stuff helps as long as you know you're not out with the family playing frisbee or. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, wearing your lanyard. Are we going to sign up for a shift tonight? Um, so when you um, signed up to volunteer, you showed, you told me what your availability was. And so I, for um, the ferry, and Western and um, Pine Point volunteers, I'm gonna send out kind of like a draft schedule later this week. Okay. Um, and you can let me know if that's gonna work for you. And if not, let me know and we'll make adjustments. So here's where we actually start entering time and records. You do have to go through a couple of pages um, to get here, which is a little bit annoying, but um, hopefully it's not. I mean, if you do this every day, it should take you, it could take you two minutes to do this every week i'm pretty slow <laughs> and when i send out the weekly um update so typically monday mornings um, i will send out an, a weekly update to all of our volunteers i'll have the link to this um and a reminder that for you to fill in um, the time that you spent on the beach so hopefully that'll just be a prompt when you read those emails oh yeah i need to fill that in and you can go in and i have a that. stupid question and most of mine are but obviously in my mind, I'm going to go to the beach during daylight hours. So at my own discretion, I can go down and patrol the beach. Yep. Yeah. So if you want to do more, if you want to spend more time on the beach than kind of what you've committed to, you're, you're welcome to do that. And likewise, if you have um, a schedule or a shift that you're going to miss, I just ask that you reach out to me and um, if, if it's not going to be covered by another person already, I will send an email to um, the volunteers for that specific beach and see if someone can cover that shift. So yeah, you can you can go more often if you'd like. Um, and if you're not going to be able to make a shift, I just ask that you let me know. I don't remember if I let you know a certain shift or not. Maybe I should tell you a shift tonight. Um, let's, let's wait until I send out the email and if there's nothing in there, you can let me know what's gonna work for you. Maybe we can just walk through yeah. a couple of these um, examples right now and have time for more of those questions at the end. Um, so let's say Jamie spent an hour on the beach yesterday. Uh, she didn't drive because she lives on Higgins. Um, this is really uh, just for our benefit if in a town like Scarborough, we certainly don't expect Jamie to know every single one of the 70 people here. If she gets a name she doesn't recognize, um, she's able to follow up. Oh, right, Tina was a volunteer at Higgins. Okay. 
and it's just miles, just the one way. It's not round trip. It, I it, love it more. Uh, uh, it is round trip. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Rack those miles oh, up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's about 24 <laughs> miles right there. Nice. <laughs> so let's say, okay, that was yesterday. Let's add yesterday. another one. Yeah. So how about Sorry. today? I went, uh, Jamie went down to the beach today. She was down there for two hours today. This time she went to a different beach. She drove eight miles to Pine Point. I don't know, I'm just making that up. Yeah. These are just example ones right now. They'll get the uh, wiped clean. That's why I don't want anyone to waste their time going through this yet until we get final clearance from my computer programmer. Um, so there's Jamie's done with her yesterday and today already. Oh, okay, I'm done. Let's get that locked in. This is you, honor system. Thank you, boom. That's it. That's literally it. So I'm hoping- It's not that tough. You just go by what it says. That's the idea. So I'm really, really hopeful that this doesn't deter anybody well, from- If you make a mistake, you gotta go back and change it. <laughs> we can do that. Also, we contact you. Yeah, just send an email. We'll have your email and your uh, phone number. <laughs> That's all we need to get in there to- okay. No mistakes, we contact you. Can't yeah, yeah you, I would say- button, Yeah, I would say reach out to, um, to me or Higgins folks, probably reach out to Glennis. Um, and let us know what the issue is, and then we will get in touch with, with Brad. Some of the things that have come up in other town meetings that I certainly couldn't have predicted were a couple that share the same email address. But as long as they have different phone numbers, then they can each log in with that. Um, I had one couple in Wells who lumps their time. I would like everyone to separate that out if you happen to do that with your partner. Um, what else came up with the Wells one, Rachel? Well, Some of the glitchy stuff. things that we fixed here. Yeah, um, I think just Armando's point and click PDF. Yes. And hoping we have suggested that this be put into a mobile format also. So if people, if you want to do it right from your phone mm -hmm. um, at the end of your shift, I don't know that that will happen this mm -hmm. season, but hopefully. Um, it will be coming that um, that there will be a mobile option. Um, this I know for me, it might I I'm basically tethered to my phone, so um, I would do it like as soon as I I got in my car at the end of my shift, I would put in that information. It so should work it. on your phone if you've got a cellular signal. It, I've been told it should. I haven't actually no, experimented with it yet. There's always well. It's very spotty. A gunkwit is hot spotty for whatever reason down in there. It's a cellular sink. But same with some of our northern beaches and this pop and sleep park. I think anywhere on the coast, it's it's hit or miss. Yeah. So yeah. as soon you know, if you or you get back to your house after your shift or back to wherever you're going, okay. put that information in so you don't forget. And please, if anyone that has is struggling with the technology, send it old school. But we would like. To not have to deal with Jamie's two-inch stack of forms at the end of the summer. Hey, I I organized those You're and top notch. Give you a, a spreadsheet with all of the information. Get a snapshot of your. Where's my gold star? Yeah. A couple things. Um, first, I got started in this because a volunteer referral, right? So I know it's a super thing, right? Particularly if that's a revenue thing. So making it. The referral process, maybe even recognition, or at least make it really easy for more people to find out uh, to become volunteers. And then, Rachel, if you're down, I think I saw a lot of people excited about any way that we can kind of see what's going on and what you're doing from the safe distance and being part of what you're doing. Because that's part of the value add of being a volunteer is knowing that you're out there doing your thing and helping people. So, if there's some way to flag, hey, Rachel's going to be on the beach in such and such a day and time, yeah. this kind of community, this kind of community is really important to me. Why I volunteer, not just to stand alone and run myself on the beach, but to be a part of this. So, any ways you can kind of nurture that experience, I think will help. 
So knowing that there is interest, um, I will try to coordinate kind of a field training with Audubon and let you all know um, when that would be. Um, I may just ask people to answer like in the, the update next week, evening better, during the day is better. Let me know like your preference and we'll try to hit as many as many people as possible. In terms of um, volunteer recognition, it's been hard during COVID. Um, I can't share too much now, but we do have a volunteer recognition event um, that we're working on for this program and a, a lot of the pro volunteer programs that we have in Scarborough um, that will should take place this summer. Um, we're hoping it um, it will take place this summer. And so information about that will be shared um, once things are a little bit more solidified mm -hmm. um, because our volunteers are you know, we can't get half the stuff done in this town without um, volunteer commitments and the help of you all. So um, it's so important to this program and so many other things that the town does. Yeah, so maybe we can collaborate with Jamie and figure out a time where it works best for you guys to come out and kind of see us in action, see us in the field, we can help you spot scrapes and spot birds. Um, my schedule is very flexible as soon as I'm done with finals this week. So um, <laughs> evenings, if you guys think it worked better for everybody to come out on a Saturday or something like that, I'm I'm not opposed to coming out and, and showing you guys the ropes. Um, so maybe we can coordinate something with Jamie and make that happen if you guys are interested in that for sure. And and just to touch on your other point, was it Mark? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's oftentimes they'll rally at Maine Audubon in Falmouth in the morning and they'll sit there and go over their coffee all right what do we need to do oh shoot we just found that new one in Old Orchard yesterday we got to get there because it's dug free for all so they are coming with this stuff up on their with their plan on the fly some, sometimes and um, I would say that there's a lot of effort involved in the Scarborough Old Orchard Saco area just because of the density of beaches in Saco Bay. Um, but it it's it would be tough to be able to give Jamie too much advance notice, maybe you know, day of or something like that. But oftentimes that's like the best the crews can do because they're really and who knows what they're gonna run into on another beach that might delay them to right. get into our, one of our beaches. So I think if we're able to do like a, a specific field training that we can schedule and, yeah. and plan in advance, that's probably our, our best case scenario. Okay. Sarah. Yeah, um, is there some way to know if there's an uncovered um, shift, if we have extra time at our beach? So um, when I send out the, um, the schedule for Ferry and Western and for Pine Point, you'll see where when everyone else is, right. is likely to be. Mm -hmm. um, and the shifts that I send are really just suggestions. So you have an idea of when to schedule your time. You can go to the beach and anytime you want. Um, so they're just kind of generalities of like, I want to say our shifts are like, you know, seven to nine thirty, sometime within that time frame. That's our morning shift. Mm -hmm. And then um, like two to um, two to four, somewhere in that range, and then um, four to seven, somewhere in that range. But you can go in the middle of the day if, if that's convenient for you. I mean, especially in the height of summer when we've got vacationers and things like that and our beaches are super busy. Um, you're really welcome to go anytime. I'm just looking, like I said, to get coverage, at least have a volunteer on the beach every day. I'm not gonna have every shift covered. Um, we don't have enough volunteers for that. So mm -hmm. as long as I have um, extra eyes and ears on the beach every day, that's my that's my goal. In clinic weather tomorrow, if you expect to be alive there. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I wanna go tomorrow. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't expect you to go in the rain. Um, the, the, our beaches aren't very busy in the rain okay. anyway. Okay. Um, okay. I've had like some people turn in observation sheets where it's like I I drove, I parked, I watched, there was no one there, so I left. And mm -hmm. if that's something that you want to do, that's fine. Okay. Bad weather, we don't expect you to go. On it's days. really difficult to to see any action when it's raining or windy. Mm -hmm. uh, any of their tracks are gone. Mm -hmm. Any scrapes that they're not sitting in are gonna gonna be gone. Um, and they're hunkered down. They're hunkered down. Yeah. They're hunkered yeah. down. Yeah. Yeah. You're, disturbance is going to cause them more stress than mm -hmm. it's worth okay. they need to conserve that energy um, Stay warm. 
Yeah. So, so plover or plover? <laughs> tomato, <laughs> tomato. <laughs> I even interchange. Them. I do too. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for asking. Plover, I don't know if you want to rhyme it with lover. It was oh, from it was phonetic. Plover is over. Plover. We do have some <laughs> wonderful uh, shirts that my wife designed actually. Plover lover uh, <laughs> at Audubon. Uh, yeah. Which is spread to other states. You should have something. Jason, there was a form that when we go, when we have our our hour, whatever it is, um, do we have to fill out something in a certain way, or is it so just notes that we take? It's just time? it's just notes that you have. Um, they're they're really optional. Um, it's just on good standing. People are all right with that. Me too. Um, they're optional. It's good to have um, some documentation if you notice. Um, or a way to document things, or if you notice things that we should be aware of, or to like if you want to remind me of like, oh, the sign is down, um, or or something like that. Um, so it, I will send out um, a a paper form that you can print off and use. Um, I've also put it into a Google form for this year, so if it's easier to to go through um, and do it electronically, that's an option also. Whatever's easier. That is separate from that and in the town observation forms they're optional so um, but I, I do suggest that you have something to write things down with or have your phone that you can type notes into or something. So if there is an instance when you, you come across a dead bird or there is an unruly dog and you can't figure out who the owner is or, or something like that, you can just make notes. Um, that you'll have to then convey to me or to police dispatch if that's who you're calling or to Audubon in the case of um, a, a, a dead or injured bird. Problem animals that are consistent and there was a, an iris setter on the loose at Higgins last year and um, we heard about that a lot. That information is good to pass to the animal control officer because we can't, we're not police either. Right. Um, and <laughs> I, I will just warn you about taking photos. Um, that is at your own discretion. If you come across a, a dead bird or something, definitely take photos. If you're seeing someone doing something that they shouldn't do, probably don't take a picture of them because if they see you, it's going to escalate the, the situation. Um, and and, don't take pictures of drunks on the beach, right? <laughs> right, yeah. No pictures <laughs> of drunks on the beach. Hopefully there won't be any. Um, so... Yeah, I will say photos are at your own discretion. Um, just use your best judgment um, and don't put yourself in an unsafe situation. A couple of years ago, I, I go to Pine Point a lot and I, I was down by the jetty and I started to hear people kind of in a high aggressive tone. The woman with dogs and then two guys with their dogs. There's so many people with rescues and dogs. But they, whatever the issue was, they were going back and forth, back and forth. And I'm just like, wow, I wonder what the issue was. But I think the woman was like, she was the one that was so shrill and crazy. That could be an observation. I mean, right. maybe it has nothing to do with the birds, but I'd like to kind of document some of these, some of these people are just out there. Yeah, and in that situation, if it was, you know, during the summer months when dogs shouldn't be in that area anyway, that may be a, a situation where, um, where you would call dispatch and if the animal control officer is is in the area they would send him down to kind of assess the situation and try to get them out of oh they, out of they, they were just the, the two parties the two guys and then this woman just at each other it's nice. what else two hours plus i know you all yeah absolutely um, all right, so if there aren't any more questions, we'll shut it down. For those in Zoom land, thank you for joining us. Don't forget to come get your um, your ID badge and your parking pass. And those that came in late, just stick around for a minute, and I will get that for you. And I'll, I'll just say also, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I think this year there's talk, there's been talk. Um, Pre-COVID, we used to have a big volunteer appreciation event at the end of every summer.